Ladies and gentlemen, yes. wake, welcome to another installment of Performance Resource. Uh, we have a guest today, and uh, that guest is sleeping, even as we speak. He's in Beijing. It's after midnight. It's past his bedtime. Ladies and gentlemen, what a sacrifice we have in Joseph. I got no idea who you are, by the way, because you're a friend of John Watkins. <laughs> I have, I, I, uh, you know, I have no idea what you do, Joseph. Can you do me a favor and, like, expound on what you do? I mean, you know, besides collect a lot of computers and screens behind you on the wall. And you're in Beijing, okay. which is nice. Right. Um, hi, I'm Joseph Rubenstein, the CTO of Umbra Technologies. Um, I'm a computer geek and been using computers most of my life. I uh, first went online in 81, sent my first email, uh, which was a BBS message to another BBS in 82. And um, ever since have been uh, doing various things with IT and I'm a coding guy, full stack. And some of the problems that I encountered uh, were around how being in Beijing, China, could I collaborate with people around the world, even though the internet um, existed. I've been in China 24 years. I needed ways to reliably move data and to communicate, collaborate. And so um, I solved problems and more problems and was doing projects that were tech related or non-tech related and using my tech skill to help enable those products. And I thought I'm being a, a bit of a schmuck because a lot of people had the problem. They were asking me to help solve the problem. And instead of just being a friendly guy, wasting time and, you know, helping people one by one and answering computer questions and, you know, helping them connect, I said, wait a minute, I've got a product here and decided to um, put together a prototype, which I did, and met a really great guy named Jorn, who's my business partner, and um, the rest is history. We've created solutions that help uh, clients move data around the world faster uh, on top of the normal internet. And so I, I, I think things up and solve problems and listen to clients and do my best to help them do what they need to do as fast as possible. My marketing, grandfather. Marketing 101, find a niche and fill it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And, my gra and you touched on something that my grandfather told me. He said uh, the first step in solving problems is realizing that you're a schmuck. And then you can <laughs> move on from there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, essentially what you're talking about is that you kind of st you got into the swimming pool with a bunch of multinational companies. And they had a problem with uh, staying current and up to time and having a secure connection and running an efficient business. And then you started solving those problems. You then met like, uh, so you're like a tech genius. Uh, you, you always down, down sell yourself, but you're a tech genius. I've known you for years. And then you met a guy who is actually an honest COO, CEO, guy who can um, finesse the system. And sometimes he can cut a hole through a wall if he needs to. Uh, and you guys well, have punched been through the wall. Yeah. Punched the, yeah. He's, he's a two time golden Wrong. glove boxer <laughs> who's now a CEO. And uh, so you guys solve problems for multinational companies uh, through connecting them, right? Well, not just multinationals, um, the executives at multinationals, government uh, organizations like embassies, finance, uh, different, different use case scenarios. But the key point is. Um, how do you efficiently and cost effectively move data over top of the internet? And mm -hmm. that's what we've done is solved those issues. Great. Yeah. So are you still using the, the snow box, the secure network optimization or am Correct. I allowed? To? Okay. Oh, Oh, sorry. Don't yeah, talk no. about, don't, don't talk about the Ferrari. The black box. No, we, we, we we can talk in general terms. We'll, we'll, okay. No, 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 we no, no. Talk no. about anything. How this, I, now, th now, that, to... now that we know that you're awesome and, and, and all that, and there's proof of the pudding and such, uh, we actually wanted to talk to you today uh, just because you are, you know, a guy who knows his stuff. I wanted to talk to you about innovation and what you see coming up 
and how people can uh, take advantage of that. So what are the trends you talk about? Mike Mike knows a good deal about blockchain, which I believe is some of what you're, well, he, he pretends to. He just He's just been putting out a publication for what, four years now <laughs> or more? I did, I, I did sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night, so. <laughs> <laughs> So, so like, so the innovation's coming up in the world. By the way, if they're not a sponsor, they at least owe us one night. Come on, or give us a robe. Give us a robe for the Holiday yes. Inn Express. Yes. The Holiday Inn Express. I want a robe. Yeah, it's like, did you know they're giving out free pens at the bank? It's even got this chain on it. Um, so. So, uh, so like the blockchain, uh, Internet of Things, uh, the world is again interconnected and such, and so there's a, there's a need for the that's that's where maybe a good portion like there's also the satellite systems which are going up. Uh, so I think you and I were having a chat before, and it's not a thousand things or ten thousand things; it's millions of things, eighty million things that are going to be coming online, right? So uh, um, not what are the billions. Innovations? Change it to be billions. Billions. Okay, so, so what are the innovations that you Billions. see coming up? Uh, and then also, if you can tell us about the innovations that you see, where uh, trends are going, but then also uh, at the end of our missive, if you can tell us, uh, the people who are listening, uh, if they're looking to get in on uh, the future, maybe they're 18, maybe they're 13, maybe they're 50, um, what is it that they should start learning? What is it that they should start getting up to speed on? Wow. Wow. Um, Solve Big the world's question. problems in 10 minutes. <laughs> from my perspective, from my perspective, um, I see the current situation as this. IPv4, the internet protocol version 4, uh, mathematically has a limitation of 4.5 approximately billion addresses for unique devices. And when that was invented, no one imagined <laughs> that there would be that many connected devices yeah. to... The, the internet, which um, the precursor to the internet was, you know, ARPANET and Datapack and all the dial-up 1200 baud modem or even slower. My first modem was 150 baud, then 300. That's bits per second, not megabits or whatever, terabytes or whatever. It was yeah. bits per second. And it was, eh, uh, you throw your phone onto a cradle and dial up and your sister picks up the line and cuts your connection <laughs> and you have to restart the upload or download. It was that kind of a fun thing. Um, but, but to get to it, the, the way things are going right now is, yes, IPv6 is out there. IPv6, right? That's umpteen, uh, well, IPv6 has enough addresses that it could solve a lot of the issues. Um, the, the, the main issues have to do with the protocols themselves and I, I'm not going to get too geeky, but TCP IP transfer control protocol is a store and forward model. Every time it jumps through a device, it has to be received in full, go to the next device received in full. And it's got a hop count, the CTL, the time to live isn't actually seconds or milliseconds or nanoseconds or whatever. It's actually how many hops it can go before it dies. And that was to stop looping through the internet. Like a, yeah. a packet kept going and it kept going around. After so many hops, it would stop and because there was no way it could be delivered. And 60 hops was crazy big. And, you know, you would never have a network with that many hops. Well, yes, you can. <laughs> and it, it's... Anyway, the, the point is that there's UDP, which is another protocol that's used, which is without the error correction, without the acknowledgement packet, it goes. If it doesn't go, the sender doesn't know it wasn't received, the receiver doesn't know it was coming, and it wouldn't be connecting and you would lose data. So when you would need, let's say, market information from the stock market, very fast moving data, during times of peak trading, if you are on a very busy network, you start losing packets. UDP, you would never know that you lost them. And so that's a bit of a problem that, that has an inherent issue. So the protocols themselves are problematic because they were designed for small use in a very confined area. Now it's globally. And the big problem is that the network speed, the, the problem back in the day was last mile. You needed a connection to get you, your internet connection from the conduit yeah. down the street yeah. into your home 
and you were dealing with you know copper wires and so there were limitations of that the actual media medium that the uh, signal could travel through now with uh, fiber to the door and into your home or office and also low, low earth orbit satellites you mentioned the satellite leos yeah. um, you can have very high bandwidth right to your to your door and so you have connectivity speeds that are very very high more devices that can be connected. You don't, for high speed yeah. with satellite, you can have any device anywhere connected and you just have to have a, a clean connection, which you can solve fairly easily. Now, what's happening, there's a convergence of many new technologies that are all happening at the same time. And where I've positioned our company, and I could be wrong, I could be right, but this is where we are, is that I see all of these different devices coming online, all of them having very fast connectivity into the internet, and then how do they all connect together on the, 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 broader, um, the, the broader application? So I want to connect with you. I'm using a, a smartphone that's fairly expensive. Um, you're using your whole studio setup, and we're both, we have accounts from an ISP but we're using a service called Zoom and Zoom has placed infrastructure everywhere so that we are as close to the Zoom servers as we can be. And then they handle all the plumbing between them and it's all wonderful. That's great for this application. Um, Zoom could also be a potential client of ours or their clients could be, we can optimize them um, because if Zoom were suddenly to put Zoom onto a fridge or um, have the microphone have its own internet account. So it's, it's not going through your phone, it's some smart device somewhere or a sensor. You're, you're gonna see, and again, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to wrap my answer into yeah. a broader answer. So you brought up new technologies, things that are happening where I see things going. Um, and you said, you know, millions of devices. It's actually not millions of devices. You used your Jedi mind trick on me because you know <laughs> that it's billions. Um, Again, with IPv4, there were billions of devices. Suddenly we've exhausted that, both for connective devices and also servers and data centers. We, we've run out of IPv4 addresses. Um, and that's part of the issue. The other issue is the number, the sheer number of devices that are gonna be online and connecting are in the tens, if not hundreds of billions of devices that are coming online. And more and more smart devices are gonna be independent. Um, you're going to see clusters of devices. And when you have like a Pico net, uh, like a small network where they all communicate with each other and then through one central node or a couple central yeah. nodes, then they connect to the internet um, for let's say smart monitoring. Somebody comes up with a really cool thing to control how much power you're using and from certain times of days or whatever, a central node will compute or, or gas meters or something, they will centralize in a one location, a supercomputer. Sure. Or maybe a couple of locations. And then all these other nodes call home and report. But then that central location has to reach out and get to a specific node and have that reliable communication. They're very good at the, the algorithms and the, the making of their software in that central node, making these devices, but they're not a network company. They need to go to a network company. And the old, let's go to the phone company and get a dedicated line connecting these two uh, locations doesn't really work anymore economically. It's very expensive. And you know how do you connect all of them together? And suddenly you become a network company and that's not their core um, capability sure. that that's not their core competence. Um, so what what I see happening with all of this, and I, I don't want to confuse everybody. I'm trying to paint a, a broader picture sure. is that you have these new technologies that are enabling fast communication. People talk about 5g, like it's the most amazing thing that since sliced bread, what 5g really is, is basically the way I can characterize it is it's like a very fast public Wi-Fi that's on towers that's only good to 100 meters, which is in yards, about 100 yards, um, before they need to place another tower. And so you've just got a very, very powerful localized network that's going to raise the bandwidth for your device. 
And what you get and what I get from my internet service provider and your internet service provider is a QoS, quality service guarantee, for my connection with them and their connection with services in their network. And we're both on the other side of the world from each other. And because we're using Zoom, Zoom is bridging the gap and they've mm -hmm. made all of that very clear. The problem is if you and I wanted to send data directly device to device and in the middle, my service provider and your service provider sign a contract with somebody else, but somewhere in the middle, somebody isn't going to honor that traffic or they're going to do, you know, hot potato routing, which is basically, well, you know, John's traffic is great and he's got a great provider. We love them. So we're going to carry their traffic, but Joe's traffic, his ISP, you know, isn't in our network. It's going to enter and we're going to dump it to somebody else as quickly as possible. And so you get different levels of service through the internet based on the QoS of your ISP and which network policies and routing. And you have no control of over the middle unless you actually physically build a direct line or deal with a satellite or something to help bridge that gap. Okay, and so um, the, the, the subject matter of our patents, a very basic thing talks about internet technology. It talks about uh, fiber, speed, all of that, the limitations of fiber, protocols, but then it starts talking about the relationship between providers. And if you were to build something over the internet today, how to make it reliable, um, we've reached a time limit. On it's Zoom. okay, we'll, we'll keep going and we have a... Hmm. Okay. Okay, so, we're good for a few more minutes. All right, cool. Uh, that means <laughs> I'm talking too much, I, I yeah. That was funny though um, when you were talking about how like the connection and Zoom bridges the gap for a moment Zoom right. kind of stuttered yeah. and I was like, yeah, was great. <laughs> yeah. they were they were essentially just going yes yes yeah. we do control hey, the quality uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, okay so yeah right. so you're you're saying so bridging the gap you don't have control over um, you have your service provider they have theirs but then again it's a marketplace where people are buying and selling so there's no uh, quality link. No one has a direct fiber. So, but your patent, your patent takes a, a takes a, a licking at that, right? You go after that. Well, what what our approach has been is we create what's called a GVN, a global virtual network. And so, for our clients, they connect as close as possible. Like when you have your connection and you use Zoom, you use Facebook, Google, whatever you're using. Um, what they've done is, if it's a content provider where you're pulling data down. They're using a CDN, and there's a great company, huge company called Akamai. Akamai. Um, there are a few others, Cloudflare, whoever. And what they do is a central computer, like a central node, um, has the content, and then they can distribute it around the world and either give the same content to everybody or do a regional localized content and control, you know, which TV shows you get in America versus what you get in Hong Kong or Japan or mm -hmm. whatever. And... But, but they can actually send that content to different nodes so that the clients connect to the one that's closest to them. And so a CDN basically eliminates the need for me to connect to a U.S. bank, having to actually have my data go to the cool. U.S., make the request and come back. I go to the server that they pay for that's close to me. And so if enough clients are in my area, they're going to put one very close to me. If not, it'll be relatively close and they will pay for a provider or their own provider network to do that cdn okay so, so your company creates a map and then is able to find no, the shortest distance well kind of <laughs> a global no, virtual we, network basically so they have it, they control the onboard and the and the offboard and they have uh, a software that um, uh, kind of predicts where the closest endpoint is and they send the data direct uh, the, well the, that's the, what the that's what a cdn is doing but what we do is actually we are analyzing the destination. So we do what's called geodestination. We right. assume that um, that you are not going to a content provider, or if you do, we, we can give you the choice of which one to go to. Um, we're saying if you have local traffic, um, it will go out your ISP connection because it goes to the nearest server to you, and you know you want to go to your local bank. You want to be in your country. 
but for other things. So we have clients that have servers in Europe or servers in America, South America, wherever, they need the best connection to there. And so what we do is through our magic box, as you described it before, people call it the black box, the snow box, whatever, is we enable the entire network to benefit from geo destination where um, we, we basically, you don't need to put anything, no app, no software on any of your devices. You just go onto your Wi-Fi as if you're using your Wi-Fi and based on where your traffic is going or where you want to connect, then that is what you are, um, you are utilizing. Sorry, I just said to get rid of a notification that was annoying. But the real power of that is giving points of presence or EIPs, egress, ingress points to our clients in locations where they have corporate servers, where they have other offices, where they're going to here. connect firewall to firewall, um, make an IPsec tunnel, and we optimize the middle, basically. We make the middle better and make it faster and Safer. at the lowest possible latency, One, highest bandwidth, all of that. Several years ago, and, and you know, I, I think that talking about, you know, saving, shaving several seconds off the communication that comes between my house here in Chandler and my bank is one thing. Yep. That's a little nebulous, but I think when we start looking at different different types of things, there was a group that built. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the group, but they built a, uh, a a direct fiber connection between the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq uh, a few years yep. ago. Um, and the 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 New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq actually had to build a box that was a whole bunch of fiber optic that would delay. Uh, the mm -hmm. communication so that communications hit all of the different uh, stock exchanges simultaneously. Um, and right. they, and they, Th those they, were, yeah. They, they spent a lot Go of money on. doing this. But yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. so uh, they had a direct connection between uh, uh, the uh, uh, Chicago Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. And if someone did a trade, right, it had to go out and travel over microwave right? And then another right. route and then eventually go back into the New York Stock Exchange and that trade would be executed. Uh, they right. had a direct connection and it was like five or six milliseconds that they had advantage on it. So whenever someone did a trade, they were actually going and buying uh, the stock at the lower price. When they made the trade, it raised the price up and then they would liquidate right away. So this was just like a little mm. money machine that would sit there and I mean, there's lots of different. It was front running, What's that? <laughs> right? It was front running, and that 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 was actually illegal. What they were doing because they were looking at one market, and um, or at least from my understanding, we we talked with some guys in the market a few years ago about this, um, and it, it was about sensing the trade orders and yeah. racing them to the market, and that was the unfair advantage. It wasn't the data was flowing faster. It was that they were taking data from one and beating the trade. Yep. And that, that was a bit, well, not a bit, it was fairly illegal uh, based on the, the fact that they were doing that. And from my understanding of the markets today, and it could have changed, I haven't had a talk with them for about two years now, but where things were going is everybody was siloing things Literally, you'd have the exchange, you'd have a wall at the data center, and they'd pay a fortune to have their supercomputer right there at the wall and put, have the quant guys come up with really funky algorithms and put them right there and keep tweaking the algos to make sure that they were trading on the other side of the wall. Um, and the big problem with silos, and this is where our slingshot technologies come into play, is that silos, what they're doing is you're building these powerful clusters of computing. And this goes for, you know, trading desks uh, into exchanges. It goes for blockchain and settlement, global settlement and all kinds of things where, where you are, the proximity, that's a very thing, a very easy thing to solve. You throw money at it, you buy the real estate, you put in a network that's fast enough. You put in optical switches versus, versus copper switches. You, you do all kinds of really funky things to shave, you know, again, microseconds off of the trade. And if you can beat the other guy to the trade, to the market, 
you can do that. And if you can get the data flow and crunch what's happening in the market fast enough and then execute a trade faster than the other one and your algo is smarter than their, their algo, your robots beat their robots and you make the trade. And that's how you make the money. So that's in the exchange. The problem is the New York desk is independent from the London desk, is independent from the Tokyo desk, is independent, and they're all getting feeds from Bloomberg or whoever, and they're all like racing to take those global feeds and put them into their, their local trading instruction set. Um, and there is a lag and there is a problem with that. Um, you were hitting on the, the shaving milliseconds off of the transmission and information flow is important and packetized data is a problem today. And yeah. as things start moving from traditional centralized computer database, master slave replication, kind of database structuring and go to blockchain, people go, oh, blockchain. And you know, a lot of people wanna cash in on it, have absolutely no clue what it is. <laughs> and you even talk to blockchain people. No, seriously, you talk to blockchain people and the, the second I start saying, okay, you're the expert and I'm the you know, networking geek and I'm like trying to understand that you have this data height that gets more complex every transaction that happens yeah. and it adds to the height of the block. Yeah. If you're talking a billion transactions a day, the height is going to grow pretty yeah, high. Don't, but we don't, and, have, we don't have the velocity for those types of transactions. Probably won't until you know, ETH 2.0, maybe, at, at ETH 2.0 will probably have capability of doing between 10 and 20,000 transactions a second, which would get us somewhere. We'll be able to replace the Visa MasterCard network. But the peer-to-peer okay. -peer concept, as far as blockchain is concerned, um, and having oracles in place that actually read the data simultaneously, right? So as you're, as you're publishing, as the, the NASDAQ trades, uh, a trade, it's not being uh, disseminated to someone else's supercomputer. It's being recorded on a block and everyone monitors that block with an Oracle. So they all mm -hmm. have the data at the same time. It's a, it's a decentralized database that enables peer to peer transactions. And it does it in a very right. eloquent way. It completely and totally disintermediates everything that has to do with the the stock exchange and all the all uh, you know all that kind of data transfer, and as we move, I mean that's only one of the things that you've uh, you've uh, uh, talked a little bit about. That's interesting. I think the, the there, there's two interesting things. Number one, don't don't think it was lost on me that you're using a computer case as a filing cabinet behind you. So <laughs> I, think I think that that is, I think that's totally classic. Uh, and the second thing is, you know we've we've gone from IP4 to IP6 and we're starting to adopt IP6 and already because of the things that are going on with IOT, we're looking at the necessary to, to actually skip IP6 and move on to IP8 because there will be billions upon billions, even trillions of devices out there eventually connected to the internet with internet of things that are basically providing uh, proof of proximity, proof of location. Um, they're providing uh, data sets, data analysis. We have, you know, a, a $65 device that we can tag up on a telephone pole outside of a agricultural area. Um, it's uh, that 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 device becomes uh, uh, solar powered, and it can sense uh, hydrocarbons for uh, you know pesticides and 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 uh, uh, fertilizers, it can test uh, sunlight, it can test uh, uh, oxygen, ca carbon monoxide, all these different types of things and uh, connect through a CDMA network so it gets an IP address, uh, but it can take that and, and, uh, uh, and record it directly to the blockchain so that uh, we have a, an ongoing record of what's happening at that corner of the field. Uh, and if we can cover enough of the field or cover a, a big enough area, and we can begin to develop and, and, and understand what, what's going on in that field a little better, then we can increase the productivity in the field. Uh, this is, I mean, the data, the data sets and the moving the data is becoming more and more important, uh, you know, e absolutely with the, each and every passing day. Mr. Rub Mr. Right. Rubenstein, 
I'm going to give I'm going to give you uh, two minutes to re to rebuttal. Uh, but uh, we, we, we need to uh, start wrapping up our, our, our talk. So please address uh, your reply. But then also I'd like to ask you um, in closing out, so how can people get, uh, get in on uh, and it's, what can they start learning? What can they start studying? What can they start looking out for to take advantage of the world as you see it coming up? Uh, also lastly, because of like Michael was talking about the, uh, the fields and such, uh, and you were talking about LEOs, LEOs, low Earth orbiting satellites and such. Um, like uh, Elon Musk has a, uh, a network coming up and such. So like your, your te yeah, the, technology, the technology that you're coming out with, um, could that be used in that situation or something of, of akin? We've actually thought up solutions to problems he doesn't even know he has yet. Um, and some of the things that we did being in China, the most hostile in, or one of the most hostile Internet uh, scenario use cases in the world. Um, there are things that we had to do for clients. And our model is listen to the client and deliver products that solve their problems, not nice. the things that we love because we're not that important. Um, they're the important one because we're serving them. Mm -hmm. And so understanding their problems, um, we can help fix things. And Mike. Um, to address your issue, I agree with you. I agree that for, or not issue, your, your scenario to address the, the, um, all the of use sudden, of blockchain. All of a sudden we're on Count Ledger. Again, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to corner you in, in, at all. Um, I wasn't trying but my to point, my, my point is that the issue that I have, the problem that I have with siloing in, yeah. let's say with the farm uh, metaphor is that you have these great computers that are doing wonderful things to, again, you're, you're saying to process 10,000 transactions a second to get it up to a million. Whatever is needed to handle the volume of data flow and, and real world scenarios. The problem is when you're starting to talk about a globally distributed system using distributed ledgers. And so uh, one of the things that we talked about with some people in a boardroom in Bermuda last year was with blockchain, doing transactions where you had uh, something of value being exchanged for something else of value and having nodes around the world accept that transaction. And what happens when somebody presents the same transa or the same value to two different transactions on opposite parts of the world in a high volume system? And when do those nodes reconcile the transactions and how do you validate it? and say that that transaction is accepted, when both of them theoretically will accept it at the same moment, they're spread not just by latency, but by a reconciliation processing time for them to replicate the data, for the nodes to all communicate with each other. And honestly, I don't know the, the actual terms right now that are that's state the, of the art for. That's, uh, that's Byzantine, that's the Byzantine fault tolerance that blockchain offers. And in the scenario okay. that you've offered, there's more than one blockchain. And in um, a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, environment, there's a single chain. And you use oracles to read a single chain or to write onto the chain. Therefore, the first one to hit that chain. Okay. How often are they reconciling? Because the people, the experts that we were talking with were saying that they had to put a 24-hour yes. yes. uh, 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 period to reconcile that data. And for me, that that was not acceptable for a real use world case uh, scenario. So my visa card, I present it, it hits the visa backbone, it authorizes in a millisecond, it comes back and the little paper flies out of the machine and I've done a transaction. But if I'm using a Canadian card sitting in Hong Kong, exactly, and they say in 24 hours, your blockchain transaction is gonna right. clear, that's a problem. And right. where Slingshot comes to play, is that instead of packetizing the data and reconciling it, we're actually lifting the entire file and dumping it and using some pretty interesting technology to move huge amounts of data at wire speed. And when it becomes Leo, it'll be as close to light speed as possible. And so solving that issue is something that you need to think about. Now, John, to your um, question about where people need to go, Think about what you love. Think about what you know. Not everybody's going to be a coder, but if you want to be a doctor, my son David wants to be a doctor. My son Michael is in computer science. Take IT courses. 
understand how technology is going to impact your industry because and your decisions. yeah and your decisions because you are going to be the custodian of robots yeah and those robots are going to help you enable to do your job better and if you can't do it you're going to be out on the street and somebody who can talk to the robots and interface with them is going to do that and michael to uh come back to where you were talking about all those sensors and all those little autonomous computers and little things that are happening, sending data. That's great because they're going to one location. The big problem is when that one location wants to talk to an individual device or all the devices and find them on a global basis when there's, as you said, tens, hundreds of billions of devices yeah. and networks get to be more complex and the routing is, you know, yep. again, your QoS is with this small little group and they're with somebody else, Absolutely. who do you go to? Yeah. And so that's where we positioned ourselves as saying, well, each of those talks to a point that is your network point that is easy to set up, it's automatic. And we handle the moving of the data back and forth to those points as if you were sitting in each of those locations. And so we're, we're handling the middle. That's our job is it's not very sexy. It's networking, but it's networking on a level where we're trying to anticipate problems and solve them and help make people's lives better um, and help the robots talk to each other better. So, so you, you have a middle out uh, algorithm. Those, those, yeah, those of you that have watched Silicon Valley are going to go crazy. on. I, I, <laughs> We have a series of approaches and technologies and methodologies and software. Um, software lives both locally and remotely and in the middle and it all collaborates. And there's, I, I, I call it central control server. I didn't yeah. call it overlord server or something, but having server availability and having an understanding of the routing and the best routes at any given time um, and just moving the data at the highest possible uh, bandwidth or lowest latency or whatever the use case is or combination and connecting as many devices as possible. So we, 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 call it, we call it SkiNet, SkiNet, spelled with an I. No, yeah. we should yeah. That's kind of, well, yeah. you, you say that, okay, so we have to wrap up, unfortunately, but you say that it's not sexy, but man, I mean, think about it. You, what you're doing is essentially you're building roads and roads, building roads isn't sexy. But if you want to help a civilization, like if you want to help people in Africa or, and, and you can't even say that Africa is on the rise. Okay. But I mean, if, let's just say that you want to help people in a third world country. Don't send them money. Don't, don't, don't send them like shirts and all that stuff. Yes. Maybe they need that. Build a road. If you can build a road from a city to their town, you just created a network. Now people from the city will try to buy things from the town. The town will try to buy things from the city. Somebody will bring in a well, somebody will bring electricity, somebody will bring an arcade machine. You're building roads and building roads arcade machine. is sexy because building roads creates an economy and furthers the economy. It's always moving. And so like you're pointing out, the old economy, it doesn't stop. So you're, I, 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 I all honesty, all transparency, I've used their, their products. That's one of the reasons I'm so giddy to have it on. I was in China and he's right. The, the abilities that they were able to do help my company to stay alive in China. And I was in a very precarious situation with competitors working all across the world and their product, I, I gotta say, it's the happiest I've ever been with my, my internet and with communication. So um, thank you so much for thank your you. time. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, I'm a lifelong lover of, of you and then also anything that you put out. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for thank burning you. the midnight oil, staying up. It's now 1 p.m. And um, so Joseph, thank you so much. Michael, yeah, yeah. any closing thoughts? Uh, uh, just a great guest, uh, John. Yeah. Thanks for bringing him on. I mean, really enjoyed the, the, the conversation. And uh, Joseph, we'll have to uh, connect again and maybe have a sidebar or maybe have you on the show. I, I look forward to it. That'd be okay, great. Wonderful. All right, we'll see, you next Tuesday and, we'll see you next Tuesday and Thursday, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm.